Hi, I'm Joe Alton, MD, also known as Dr. Bones of doomandbloom.net, where you'll find over 800 posts, videos, and podcasts on medical preparedness for any disaster. Together with my wife, Amy Alden, a nurse practitioner with the New York Times and Amazon best-selling authors of The Survival Medicine Handbook, right here, and other books, including the brand new Zika Virus Handbook, could be a big issue this summer. Plus, we are the designers of the awesome board game Doom and Bloom Survival, recently named by the Prepared Family blog as the Teaching Preparedness Resource of the Week. I was recently asked to write an article about botulism as it relates to home canning to preserve food by our good friends at Backwoods Home Magazine, which is a great read for homesteaders and preppers alike. That's backwoodshome.com. I realized that I had never made a video about botulism in general, so here goes. Home canning is a great way to have good things to eat, even in the coldest of winters. Canning food products that can be enjoyed by family and friends is a, certainly a fulfilling project, and more and more people are learning this very useful skill. Despite that, few regularly can food when it's done for them by the companies that fill supermarket shelves. But home canners and even food conglomerates sometimes make mistakes, and when they do, Pathogens, that's disease-causing organisms, can invade the very stuff that we depend upon in our food storage. And one of these pathogens is Clostridia botulinum. Clostridia botulinum is a rod-shaped bacteria found in soil worldwide. The organism is anaerobic, which means that it grows best in conditions where oxygen is absent. In addition, it forms spores that survive in a dormant state until conditions favor their development. You might be surprised to know that botulinum spores exist on most fresh food surfaces. Here they're harmless because the spores activate only in the absence of air. Clostridium botulinum spores are hardy, heat resistant, and they exist just about everywhere. Once in a favorable oxygen poor environment, they activate. And this leads to the production of certain noxious substances called toxins, some of which are so dangerous they've been considered as biological weapons. There are a number of different botulinum toxins, some of which cause illness in humans, others in animals. The illness, which primarily affects the nervous system, is called botulism. First described as a disease in the 18th century in people who got sick after eating contaminated meat, the word botulism is derived from the Latin word for sausage. The bacteria itself wasn't isolated until the beginning of the 20th century. With advancements in home and commercial processing of food, botulism is much less common than it once was. Despite this, over 100 cases are reported in the United States every year. Although there are various ways that botulism may be transmitted, three types are the most common. Infant botulism, and that occurs after consuming spores of the bacteria, which activate and multiply in the intestinal tract. The source of infant botulism may be ingestion of honey, and that's why the FDA warns against it in the first year of life. Now, despite this, it's much more likely to be caused by exposure to soil that contains a bacteria. There's wound botulism also. When a wound, even a scratch, is contaminated with Clostridia botulinum, Toxins produced by spores can cause major damage. In recent decades, wound botulism has occurred not so much in accidental trauma as in self-inflicted injury, the injection of heroin. Foodborne botulism in canned foods is seen in foods that are low in acid with a pH of about 4.6 or lower. Low acid foods include, according to the USDA, red meats, seafood, poultry, milk, and all fresh vegetables except for most tomatoes, which are actually fruits. Clostridia botulinum doesn't seem to find high acid and refrigerated foods quite as agreeable. Now, it should be noted that botulism does not spread from human to human, at least it doesn't appear to. When a cluster of cases is identified, it's usually because the group ate the same contaminated food. And that's something that definitely can happen in survival settings. Now, when you eat food containing botulism neurotoxins, a chemical known as acetylcholine is inhibited. This chemical is required for nerve cells to communicate with each other and to control movement and other vital functions. And the end result is paralysis if untreated. 
Other symptoms, however, can be seen earlier, and usually, I guess, within a day or so of exposure. These include uh, blurred vision, double vision, weakness of facial muscles, difficulty speaking and swallowing, droopy eyelids, dizziness and fatigue, nausea and vomiting, dry mouth, abdominal cramps, and finally, difficulty breathing. Untreated botulism carries a death rate of close to 10%, usually due to respiratory failure in scenarios without access to advanced methods of mechanical ventilation. Think survival settings. Paralysis of extremities can occur and be very slow to recover in survivors. A medic can usually suspect a diagnosis of botulism from the history, physical signs, and symptoms of the patient. However, a number of other nerve conditions, such as Guillain-Barre syndrome, recently tied to Zika virus infection, and even strokes, can produce similar symptoms. Supportive care should be initiated, especially respiratory support if possible. If botulism was likely to come from recently ingested food, many physicians will induce vomiting with syrup of Ipecac, I-P-E-C-A-C, or even administer enemas to remove as much of the offending items as possible. The definitive treatment for foodborne botulism is an antitoxin derived from horse serum. Obviously not something you're going to have in your medical kit. Although it eliminates the ill effects of botulism toxins, nerve damage is not erased. Luckily, humans can regenerate some nervous tissue, although the process may take months of rehab. Full recovery can be expected, however, in a majority of cases. Although caused by bacteria, antibiotics like clindamycin and penicillin G are effective only in cases of wound botulism, which may also require surgical removal of affected tissue. Although a vaccine exists against botulism, it's of limited effectiveness and has some unwanted side effects. Home canners should follow the guidelines set in the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Complete Guide to Home Canning that's easily accessible online. The guide has been recently updated, so make sure you have the most recent version. If the guidelines are strictly followed, you will prevent the growth of pathogens and importantly, help form a high vacuum in jars. Good vacuum forms a tight seal, keeps liquid in and most germs out. Botulinum spores are heat resistant and may survive basic boiling water temperatures. All low acid foods should be sterilized at temperatures of 240 to 250 degrees Fahrenheit with pressure canners operated at 10 to 15 PSI. Using proper technique, the time needed to destroy bacteria in low acid canned food ranges from about 20 to 100 minutes. The exact time is variable based on the type of food being canned, the way it's packed into jars, and the size of the jars. Even if there is no evidence of spoilage, the USDA recommends that canned, low acid, and tomato foods be boiled in a saucepan before consuming. At sea level or altitudes below 1,000 feet, boil food for about 10 minutes. As water boils at a lower temperature at higher altitudes, add an additional minute of boiling time for each 1,000 foot rise in elevation at your location. Spinach and corn, by the way, should be boiled for about 20 minutes or longer. In addition, never eat canned foods if the container bulges, leaks, or has mold. They should retain their original shape and not appear to have become mushy. Toss any food that foams or emits a strange odor when boiled. In a survival scenario, we'll have more issues with botulism than we do now. With some attention to detail though, you can safely can your fresh food and avoid the threat of foodborne botulism. This is Joe Alden, MD, that old Dr. Bones, wishing you the best of health in good times or bad. Thanks for watching. Hey, if you need a solid medical kit for the range, for that hunting trip, or for disaster settings, check out Nurse Amy's entire line at store.doomandbloom.net. Thanks again. <music>